Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt holds a, the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., where he has worked for 30 years almost. Um, he researches and writes extensively on demographics and economic development generally, and more specifically on international security in the Korean Peninsula and Asia. Domestically, he focuses, focuses on poverty and social well-being. He is also a senior advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research. He's published many books and monographs beginning in 1979 with uh, Poverty in China. And two of his more recent books uh, are on the topic of Russia's peacetime demographic crisis in 2010 and Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis in 2016. And it is that book that uh, brings us together today. He will be talking about uh, the data and the uh, analysis of uh, that book. He has offered invited testimony before Congress on numerous occasions, <clears throat> including day before yesterday, I think, uh, and consulted, uh, served as a consultant or advisor for a variety of units within the U.S. government. He's appeared on radio and television, ranging from NPR to CNN's The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. He has a Ph.D. in political economy and government and also an MPA from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and an A.B. from Harvard University and a master's degree, a master of science degree from the London School of Economics. In 2012, uh, Dr. Eberstadt was awarded the prestigious Bradley Prize. Some of you may be uh, familiar with that. It, that is no small testament to his, the respect and the uh, uh, quality of his work. We're pleased that he would come and be with us today. He's a gentleman. Uh, a first-class scholar, and it's been a pleasure to be able to host him while he's been here. Now we'll be pleased to hear from Nicholas Everstadt. Professor Williams, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Is this better? Yes. Uh, Professor Williams, thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to my presentation. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be invited to the Wheatley Institution. It is an honor to be presenting uh, before Mr. Wheatley himself. Um, that was, a, uh, that was a beautiful introduction, and I would add only one thing to it. Uh, in our family, we know that the uh, secret weapon in the household is Mary Eberstadt, and I've heard rumors that she's going to be coming out here in a week or two. Uh, I, so, um, what, I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some of my findings from my latest uh, book, it's a little book, a short book. It's got lots of uh, charts in it. Uh, I commend it to you. <clears throat> but it's on, a, uh, it's on a very big subject, and I think a very uh, troubling one. Uh, the reason I call it uh, Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis, is because this enormous social problem in the United States uh, seems to have been overlooked very largely uh, by the talking and deciding classes in our nation for decade after decade as this problem has gathered and gathered and grown and grown. Um, what, what I'd argue is that over the last two generations, over the last half century, there is a quiet calamity that has befallen our country. And that calamity is the collapse of work for men. Uh, what we have seen over this long period of time, uh, quietly but relentlessly, is a decline in the work rates, in the employment to population ratio for men in our society. 
over the last decade and a half, things haven't been going so well with regard to the labor market for women either, but the problem with men has been going on for much longer. It's a longer problem and it's much greater in magnitude. We have seen, we have witnessed a flight from work by men of enormous proportion over the past two generations, so great a flight that nowadays there's an invisible army of seven million men in the prime of life between 25 and 54 years of age who are neither working nor looking for work. And I suppose I am uh, only belaboring the obvious by saying there's absolutely nothing good that comes for our economy or our society or our polity from any of this. Uh, but I'll get into this in a little bit more detail uh, in the following minutes. So to frame this uh, problem, I thought it would be useful to show a little bit of background on how America is doing economically in the 21st century. And if you ask how the American economy has been doing since the year 2000, it's very, very hard to give one single unambiguous answer. The reason for this is because we have trends going in all different directions. Um, if you take a look at personal wealth, at a net worth of households and non-government uh, non institutions, you can make the argument that things have never been better in America, that things have been uh, on a roaring trajectory. You can see that things uh, took a pretty big dip uh, after the crash of 2008, but personal wealth is at a level over $22 million higher than at its apogee before the crash. And if you were to divide America's per capita uh, personal wealth on a per capita basis, for a notional family of four, it would average out to more than a million dollars a person right now. It's a phenomenal amount of money. So if we, could, if we stopped a lecture here and went home, we'd say, uh, mission accomplished, things are great. But it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit more dicey than that. Because while well, uh, personal wealth has been uh, growing tremendously well, the economy has been very weak. In fact, uh, there is no long period in the post-war era where the American economy has been growing as slowly and as weakly as it has since the year 2000. And it's not just the crash and the weak snap back from the crash. This is a long-term trend. If America's economy had just been growing on the trajectory of the earlier post-war period, of the half century before, uh, per capita output in America would be about 20% higher than it is today. That's not a small difference. So if, uh, if wealth has been uh, on a fine track and the economy might charitably be described as uh, registering mediocre performance, uh, the, uh, the soundings from the labor market have been dismal. Uh, this is the employment to population ratio for all Americans, male and female, from the year 2000 to more or less the present. Uh, and um, these numbers on the side, um, let me just provide you a little bit of context. If, uh, if we just had a work rate that was back up to year 2000 levels, we'd have about 11 million more paying jobs in the United States than we have today. Um, you can see over here, in terms of employment to population rates, we really haven't had much of a recovery since the crash of 2008. So we have a sort of a classic formulation for a populist reaction. Lots more money, weak economy, less work for workers. I'm not going to try to connect the dots between this tableau and the election of 2016, but I think you can see that there's plenty of uh, room for discontent in this sort of a scenario. But if the overall employment situation has looked pretty dismal for the United States since the year 2000, uh, 
the, uh, the prospect for men over the post-war period has been just awful. What I show here are a couple of different measures of the work rate for men from 1948, when we first started to collect our uh, modern series of monthly labor statistics, modern employment statistics, and the present. And if you look at the blue line, which is uh, men 20 and older, you see a really dismal continuing decline. Um, you can say to me, OK, Eberstadt, you're fooling with the figures here because we know America is a grayer society now than it was right after World War II, and that's fair enough. But if you look at the gray line, this is for men in the prime of their lives, what labor economists call prime age men, the 25 to 54 group. This is an apples to apples comparison. And if you look from about, about 1965, you see this kind of step effect, kind of stabilizes and it goes down again, and it kind of stabilizes and it goes down again, and it keeps on ratcheting down. Um, if, if we had the same work rates today that we had back in 1965, there would be almost 10 million more paid jobs for prime age men, or excuse me, for, for men as a whole, and about 6 million more for prime age men. And think how different our society would be with that. Um, another way of looking at this uh, quiet calamity that I've been describing is tracking the proportion of prime age men who don't have paid work. What proportion of civilian, non-institutional men, people who aren't in the military, people who aren't behind bars or in hospitals, long-term hospitals, what proportion of these guys have no paid work? Well, you can see how this has, it sort of um, didn't have any real strong trend until the mid-1960s. But since then, there's been an almost relentless ratcheting up over time from about 5% to now, uh, I think at the moment, about 14%. And if you look at the year 2015, which was kind of the um, anchor for my study, uh, at that point in time, one in six uh, prime age men had no paid work at all, one in six. So what does that look like in historical perspective? Um, it is a depression scale disaster. And I'm not being hyperbolic here. I'll show you why I talk about this as a depression scale problem. Because we've got a little bit of data from the depression. We didn't collect monthly employment statistics then, but we did hold two national population censuses, one in 1930 and one in 1940. And if you do the apples to apples comparison, these numbers may be hard to see in the back of the room, but for guys uh, 20 to 64 years of age, the work rate was actually almost three percentage points lower in 2015 than in 1940 at the tail end of the Depression. And the work rate for prime age guys was two percentage points lower than in 1940 at the tail end of the Depression. The unemployment rate in 1940 for the country as a whole, by the way, was almost 15%. So once again, I'm not being hyperbolic in saying that the collapse of work for men in America today verges on a depression level problem. So uh, you may ask very reasonably, um, if we have a almost depression scale collapse of work for men in America today, why haven't we heard more about it? How come it's been so quiet? Uh, why haven't we read more about this? Um, I think there are a couple of reasons. One, of course, is because there's been an enormous, and I think a very positive, beneficial influx of women into the workforce over the post-war era. This has improved American prosperity, opened great options, great vistas, and uh, 
the influx of women into the workforce uh, did not replace men, it supplemented men, but it meant, among other things, that we didn't have labor shortages. The other reason that you haven't heard so much about it is because this uh, collapse in work, in some important sense, has been voluntary. And when I say it has been voluntary, what I mean is that there has been an exit from the labor force of increasing numbers of men who now are neither working nor looking for work. Um, these three lines show different takes on this. We could look at, this is the labor force participation rate. This is the percentage of men of different ages who are either employed or looking for work. People are in the labor force. And you can see that for the 20 plus group of men, it's really sagged over the post-war period. Uh, for the 20 to 64s, it's also gone down really strong. And the same is true for prime age men, for the 25 to 54s, for this key working age group, didn't really start going down until about 65. And it's really dropped since then. Um, if we just use unemployment statistics to measure the health of our labor market, we're doing the same sort of thing as counting cavalry brigades and trying to figure out what our military readiness is like today. It's looking at a bygone era. Um, there was a time when unemployment statistics told you a whole lot about labor market conditions. That was in the sort of, if you will, the Dickensian era when there were really just two options for working age men, either to have a job or to be looking for one. Um, but today, things aren't quite as black and white. And there's a third option that has emerged for men, which is not being in the labor force at all, which is neither working nor looking for work, uh, not in labor force, NILF. And this not in labor force contingent is by far the very fastest growing group of the American working age male population. I thought this chart would be one way of showing what I'm talking about. It shows the head count, just the you know, total numbers, not rates, just total numbers of guys between the ages of 25 and 54 um, who are unemployed. That's the blue line. Unemployed in any given month or out of the labor force altogether, neither working nor looking for work. That's the gray line. And you can see especially since about the mid-60s, how exponential the growth has been for this group of men who have exited from the workforce altogether. And if you go down towards where we're living today, down towards 2016, I don't have 2017 figures up here yet, you'll see that for every unemployed prime age guy, there are three guys who are neither working nor looking for work. So if you're just following the unemployment rate, you're missing three quarters of the story. By the way, this is a problem which has been building from generation to generation and cohort to cohort. I've cribbed this uh, chart from a study that was done last year, I think on the whole, a very good study, done by uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors about the declining male uh, workforce participation rates. And uh, what this chart shows is the workforce participation rate for guys at different ages, 25, 35, 45, up to 54, for the cohort born in the, between 33 to 42, 43 to 52, 53 to 62, and so on and so forth. But you see one thing, at any given age of life, depending upon which birth cohort you're in, it's going down. So that older brothers were more likely to be in the workforce than younger brothers, and sons are more likely to be out of the workforce, 
than their fathers, and uh, older brothers of the fathers were more likely to be in the workforce than the fathers themselves. Um, it's almost as if there were some sort of gravitational force pulling this down. Um, we have to wonder why that is. I've got a couple of surmises that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes. But you can see that we've been on track for decades towards uh, lower labor force participation by birth cohorts, with each birth cohort on a lower and worse trajectory than the one before it. Okay. <clears throat> I realize you did not come to a modern art show. Um, so let me tell you, there's only one line in this chart that matters at all, and that's the thick, black, dashed, kind of jagged line, because uh, that's the USA. Uh, what this chart shows are the labor force participation rates over the post-war era for rich countries, uh, countries that were never communist, uh, which is to say Western Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and us. And you'll see that we've won a race to the bottom here. And this is the workforce participation rates for prime age men. It's not a race we should want to win. Um, all of these countries have seen a little bit of decline in workforce participation for guys over the post-war era, at least a little bit. Um, but ours is s much starker than any other country. And you have to wonder, why would this be so? Uh, two things which seem mysterious about this, to me at least. One is that um, our economy has been growing a lot faster than many of these other economies, especially over the last generation. Uh, and two, uh, as we hear often from foreign friends, the United States doesn't have a more generous welfare state than a lot of these other countries. So why did we perform so much worse if we're uh, not the most lavish welfare state and if we've had better economic growth? Something to come back to. <clears throat> I want to talk for a minute about this army of seven million I mentioned, the, uh, the unworking men in our prime age groups today. Um, if you have a group of seven million, you're probably going to have pretty much some of everybody in America. But there are some, uh, there are some people who are overrepresented in the group. If you look at education, men with lower educational attainment are overrepresented, especially high school dropouts. If you look at uh, family structure, men who have never been married or don't have children at home are way overrepresented in this grouping compared to married men or married men with children at home. Um, if you look at ethnicity, African Americans are overrepresented, but interestingly enough, among people of color, uh, Latinos or Hispanics are underrepresented. Uh, Hispanics have higher work rates and higher labor force participation rates in this prime uh, age group for men than the national average. And finally, if you look at, um, I guess what's called nativity, uh, uh, inelegant, um, if you look at whether people are foreign born or native born, native born men are overrepresented in this pool of unworking. But we don't live in a world where these uh, social odds determine everything about outcomes, uh, where we're just kind of helpless victims in the face of social trends. And I have a few charts here to show you what I mean by this. I told you that African Americans, that black men, are overrepresented in the pool of unworking guys. But if you look at the work, uh, workforce participation rates for black guys who are married, they're higher than for white guys who are not married. So marriage beats out ethnic disadvantage here in this particular case. Or if you look at another one, we know about educational advantage and disadvantage. 
but one of these charts is married guys who are high school dropouts, and the other is for guys who have college degrees or better but are unmarried. And the point is you really can't tell the difference here. So marriage, again, counteracts the effect of educational disadvantages or educational disparities in this particular case. And I'll show you one more, which I find quite fascinating. Um, that blue line at the top is native-born guys who have a college degree or higher. And the jaggedy gray line is the foreign-born, the immigrant men who are high school dropouts. They're not quite equal, but they're very close to being equal. And if you think about immigrants without a high school diploma and native-born American guys with college education or more, just about the only thing they have in common is their high labor force participation rates at this point. Now, I am not trying to suggest or insinuate that there is some magical property in wedding rings or in green cards that account for these results. It's rather that people who get married and people who immigrate to the United States uh, tend in large numbers, on average, to have different values and motivations and aspirations and behavior from other groups. And these motivations and aspirations, outlook, behavior, call them human agency, call them agency, but they have a great deal to do with accomplishments for individual human beings. So that, that's what I see in this part of the story. Um, one of the questions I asked myself in doing this homework uh, was, um, if guys are out of the labor force and neither working nor looking for work, what do they do all day long? I mean, what do they do from the time they wake up until they go to sleep? And um, one aperture, one helper, aid for trying to answer this question is uh, what's called time use surveys. The Bureau of Labor Statistics asks very large numbers of people um, every year to detail, to give great detail about how they spend their days. They use this to try to understand better about work patterns and how changing uh, patterns of work over the course of the day and the course of the year and so forth. Uh, but one thing which we can find from this is what the reported uh, patterns are for guys who don't work at all, who neither work nor look for work, the unworking. Um, we have to remember that these are survey results that are self-reported, and there's always at least a little bit of um, whatever the nice word for lying is in self-reported data. Um, but take that as it may. Take it with a grain of salt. Let's see what it says. Um, I don't expect you to look at each one of these numbers, so I'll tell you the general outline of what these describe. Um, unworking guys basically don't do civil society. Uh, less than working men or women, less than unemployed men, uh, are they involved in religious activity or in charitable work or in other sorts of volunteering uh, outside the household. They also don't do much in the way of child care or help with other members, household care for other members of the family. Less than unemployed men, a whole lot less than employed women who are the most uh, time poor people in the universe. They also uh, don't do all that much in the way of cleaning or care around the house certainly not compared to employed women or even unemployed men. What they do is they watch. They report looking at movies, television, other things, uh, presumably on TVs, internet, handheld devices, other things. And they report doing about 2,100 hours a year of watching. It's like a full-time job. Um, what does this tell us about their prospects for getting back into the workforce. Uh, we do know that we've had a real world, a real life experiment, where tens of millions of people have gotten back into the workforce after being out of it for years. 
Um, and the people that I'm talking to, referring to here, are called women. And most of the people that I was just talking to are called mothers. Um, what everyone will say about mothers, uh, mothers are never idle. There aren't sick days. Uh, you don't get uh, time off. Uh, you don't get to fill that slip out in advance. And the, uh, the habits of mothers, um, reliability, dependability, keeping a schedule, irrespective of one's uh, educational attainment, are the sorts of things I think that employers find attractive and valuable. Uh, we have to ask ourselves whether the self-reported idle men that I've described here, the unworking idle men, uh, can be described in the same sort of manner. Um, <clears throat> now I want to get to the part about trying to explain what's happened. Um, oh, I'm, uh, I described myself to uh, um, Richard earlier as a, I'm, I'm a recovering economist. And so when I was trained in economics, uh, I learned um, that you think about a problem like this in terms of demand and supply and institutional barriers. Well, the demand part of the question has to do with whether there are just less jobs out there for men today. Um, and I think to some degree, we do have a demand problem. We know about the decline of manufacturing. We know about globalization. We know about offshoring. We know about all of that. Um, but a whole lot of other countries around the world that I showed you earlier also are part of a global economy, and they haven't had the same results as us. They haven't had the same uniquely bad results. So um, I would say that, the, that economic change is certainly part of our men without work problem, but I'd also qualify it more than maybe some other uh, uh, people who have written about this problem. And I'll show you a couple of reasons why I think that uh, economic change is not the whole story here. First is this chart. This chart shows what uh, would be called inactivity rates, the percentage of men of prime age who are not looking for jobs or holding jobs, uh, those who are not part of the labor force. Between 1965 and 2016, you can basically draw a straight line up for the proportion of men who are not in the workforce. You can't see from this chart here when the recessions were. You can't see from this chart here when the crash of 2008 occurred. You can't see from this chart here when we had real boom times in the economy, like in the 60s or in the 90s. Um, this just looks like a relentless exodus. And that's not what you'd expect if things were being influenced or determined by the business cycle. Here's another complication. Remember I told you that the bottom is more or less dropped out in labor force participation for guys without high school degrees. But it hasn't dropped out for all high school dropouts. Um, this shows you two different trajectories for guys without high school degrees who are between 25 and 54 years of age. The top one is high school dropouts who came to America from other countries. The bottom one is native born Americans. There's a 25 point gap there between these two. That's not what you would expect if this was a matter of less demand for low skilled labor in the United States per se. One more thing to show you. This is the difference in inactivity rates for men from one state to the next in the United States. If we had a national labor force and a national labor market with uh, market clearing, equilibrium seeking properties, which is kind of like a demand side explanation, after a shock you'd expect things to equalize and come back towards equilibrium across the country. Instead, what we've seen is bigger and bigger and bigger differences between our different states over the post-war era in general and since 1980 in particular. And to make the problem even more acute, we can see that some of the places which have the very most uh, disappointing uh, inactivity rates for men are adjacent to some of the places which have the very most hopeful ones. So West Virginia, for example, which has got 
one of the, which has perennially got the uh, highest inactivity rate for men, borders on Maryland, which is here, Virginia, which is here, Maine, which is in that circle up there, um, borders on New Hampshire. In fact, New Hampshire is its only border in the United States. Um, this can't all be explained by demand, is my point. There are other things going on here. And um, let me talk just for a moment about supply side effects, about withholding of labor or not being in the labor market. Um, <clears throat> one terribly important uh, question, I think, concerns the role of disability programs in America today. We established disability programs for a reason, which was to protect people who could not work. So it was one of the original aspects of our social security program. But to a great degree now, uh, the disability program serves the perverse and unintended consequence of a sort of an alternative uh, unemployment insurance. And I'll show you what I mean by that if we just look at these numbers here. Um, this chart that I've kind of, this column I've highlighted here uh, reports the proportion of men of different work categories or statuses who report they're receiving one or more disability benefits. Um, and in 2013, almost three out of five of the men who were out of the labor force reported receiving benefits from at least one disability program. Two-thirds of them said they lived in households that were getting at least one benefit. 14%, um, meaning about a million, reported getting two or more disability program benefits. Now, to be very clear about this, um, you can't live a wonderful, opulent uh, life on disability benefits. It's a terrible, tragic waste of human resources. And I'm not trying to suggest that uh, disability programs have created the flight from work, because I can't prove that and nobody else can prove that. But what I think is incontestable is that disability programs are increasingly financing, funding the flight from work an alternative lifestyle to work. And you can see that from looking at figures back 20 years earlier, when uh, less than 40% of guys who were out of the labor force were receiving one or more disability benefits, jumping almost 20% in this short period of time. So that's supply side. Um, I thought I was gonna wrap up my book very quickly uh, with a kind of a due diligence chapter about uh, crime and punishment. And so I, uh, I took out the statistical abstract and I looked for the chapter that would show me the employment rates for men who had a felony conviction. And I found there wasn't that chapter. There's no information on that in the statistical abstract. And I looked a little further and found out actually the Bureau of Labor Statistics has no information on this and the Census Bureau has no information on this, and the Department of Justice Statistics has no information on this, and in fact, the US government collects no information on this, whatever. Um, now, back when the United States had, uh, if we can put the word only in quotes, only a million or two million people who had been sentenced to a felony conviction, that would be one thing, but today, in our real existing America, uh, according some, to some estimates of non-government demographers who produced these numbers, um, we have about 20 million American men and women, overwhelmingly men, uh, who are not behind bars, but who have at least one felony conviction in their background. And what that means is that something like one in eight adult men in our country, not behind bars, you know, in society as a whole, uh, has a felony conviction in their history. That's a big number. It is unlike any number for any other rich society uh, today or in the 
um, recent past. Um, so what are the workforce participation rates and work rates like for men who've had trouble with the law? As I said, you can't find that in U.S. government statistics. It isn't there. I mean, I think it's scandalous that it's not there, but it's not there. So I tried to recreate these with uh, uh, a big shout out to Professor Joe Price, who is here. Uh, uh, Joe Price, Professor Price, and uh, uh, his posse of graduate students helped me on this one when I was getting right down near the buzzer on this book. Um, these numbers aren't entirely comparable uh, to Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers, but they tell a story, and the story is pretty uh, coherent um, and consistent. No matter what the age of men in the post-war era, uh, no matter what their ethnicity, no matter what their educational attainment level might be, if they have an arrest in their background, excuse me, if they have a prison sentence in their background, they are way more likely to be out of the labor force than if they only have an arrest, I say only with quotes, and if they only have an arrest, and again I put the quotes on only, they are way more likely to be out of the labor force than if they've never had trouble with the law at all. It's commonsensical, tracks with what we'd expect to see in reality, but we don't have those numbers uh, available for us. And because we don't have those numbers or other numbers like them available for us, we can't have the evidence for evidence-based policy for trying to turn this problem around and trying to improve re-entry. Um, so, where does this uh, leave us? Um, the collapse of work for men, as I said at the beginning, I think is a social change. Uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's an ill wind that blows no one good, <laughs> to, uh, to make a little twist on the aphorism. Uh, it means slower economic growth, wider wealth gaps in our society, bigger budget deficits, more welfare dependence, more public debt. It means more pressure on fragile families in our society. It means less social mobility in our society. It means less civil participation in our society. It means a weaker polity for our nation. Um, my hope in trying to uh, cast a little bit of light on this in this one modest attempt was to encourage others to look at this problem too because I don't really think we can turn this terrible problem around unless our entire society takes a little bit of ownership of it, unless people with all sorts of different viewpoints uh, come together in the public square, recognize what a grave social ill this is, offer their own suggestions for how to deal with it, because there are lots of different ways of dealing with it, I imagine. Um, if we don't do that, I'm afraid that the problem will only continue to fester and uh, almost surely to worsen as well. So uh, thank you for your patience and listening to my presentation. I'm happy to discuss any aspect of it you'd like to. Thank you. Appreciate you coming today. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, several times in your presentation, you mentioned the year 1965. Do you have an opinion on why that date might be significant? <laughs> Some hypothesis of how it could be a point of deportation for this drop out of the labor force participation rate? Thank you. Um, I, I, in in part, I used 1965 as a departure point for the study because it made a nice neat period between 65 and 2015, made a half century period that I could look at. But there are also other things that we know uh, would give significance to 1965. 1965 was the beginning, uh, the rollout of the war on poverty and the big expansion of America's uh, social welfare and means-tested benefit 
uh, programs. 1965 was also the year of our uh, Immigration Reform Act and set in motion a big uh, wave of legal and not so legal immigration that has uh, changed uh, America's composition in major ways. And also 1965 was about the time when the, uh, when the post-war crime explosion really um, took off. And I didn't, uh, I didn't show any charts uh, in my presentation today, but in my book, I show some charts about uh, violent and property crime in the post-war era, how they started to really soar around 1965, and with a delayed response, how punishment of crime uh, followed that, and how big increases in incarceration and sentencing followed that. So I would say that for all of those reasons, uh, we might think that 1965 is, in addition to being a kind of an arbitrary 50-year uh, anchor for a study, uh, a year with some real significance to it. Thank you. So my name is Mark. I'm a documentary photographer, and I've actually been working on the, a project the past five years on rural swimming in the United States. So kind of unwittingly going into it, I've spent hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of hours talking to these men hanging out by the river. And one, I mean, a, a theory I've kind of come up with is that kind of in the 70s, there was a great awakening with uh, post-structuralism, uh, scientism, and uh, California spiritualism. And these are all things that we discuss extensively in this room. But the way those ideologies kind of filtered down to the riverbank in mm -hmm. Tennessee was just kind of like pleasure. It successfully destroyed religion and kind of like uh, objective ideas like acting like a man. But they kind of picked up on uh, the goal in life is to maximize pleasure. And for them, that's much more easy to, if there's um, some girlfriends you can sleep with, you know, changing, uh, play Xbox and have a six pack, you're pretty good. I mean, would you feel that is a cause of it or? Well, I mean, that's a really important question because I'm uh, kind of a numbers nerd who tries to stick with uh, statistics. It's hard for me to get the sort of empirical data uh, that I'd like to have before uh, making generalizations like that. Um, on the other hand, if you do the thought experiment, is it possible to imagine such a large proportion of men uh, not looking for work, uh, being supported by government, being supported by family or girlfriends at any previous age in American history? I think the answer is pretty clear. And the question of why would have to do with changes in mores or acceptable norms. Um, there's one thing that I'm sure you saw that I didn't mention in here, uh, and that has to do with the uh, scourge of the opioid explosion, also among non-working men in, uh, in the US over this period of time. And I don't have really great data on that, but <clears throat> Uh, Professor Alan Kruger at Princeton last year uh, published a study uh, based on some of a survey of his own where he suggested that almost half of the unworking men uh, reported taking painkillers every day. Um, so it's not just the TV and the internet that I'm talking about, but it's doing it stoned. Um, then, and another question which comes up uh, has to do with how, how, where does all this, uh, where does all this, uh, the painkillers or the uh, opioids come from? I mean, uh, oxy, uh, oxycodone, oxycontin, oxycontin's pretty expensive. Um, part of the answer uh, has to do with, uh, with Medicaid dependence as well. And I'm sure you saw Medicaid dependence while you were uh, making, doing your great work on yeah. your documentary. So for a, for a $3 copay, uh, you can get a, a month's prescription of, uh, you could get, this is tightened up a little bit, you could get a month's prescription of uh, Oxycontin, you could use or sell or whatever. Um, 
But this means that the government and the Medicaid program was directly involved also in this change of attitudes and in this change of dependence in a kind of a troubling way. So uh, I, think it, I think it is almost, is almost incontestable what you suggest, but I don't have the numbers that would allow me to uh, okay, well, I, that's, that's the glory of being an artist, I can just say yeah. it. Well, <laughs> I don't need I mean, numbers. And by, and by the way, we need, we need a lot more artists looking at this. Yeah. We also need a lot more uh, qualitative, non-quantitative types, uh, people unlike me. Uh, we need great journalists and great anthropologists and other people to sit down and describe, live with, sit down, empathize with, and describe what's going on in so much of our country, because we don't have that either. Yeah, well, and it's interesting because I, I do move between the art world and then this kind of very not art world w location. <laughs> and uh, what, the thing I've, n it's interesting to me, like post-structuralism, which is the religion of art, is discussed in such a way by very rich people have these cushions in their life where they can act and seek out pleasure very effectively. But then at the lower class level, those, those safety nets don't exist. So it just ends up being very painful. No guardrails. Yeah. No guardrails. Thank you. This might overlap a little bit what you just described, yes. but I see 65, 1965 onward, maybe a decade and a half, where you have Griswold versus Connecticut mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Ro Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Sure. And it cre didn't it create that uh, cultural change where men didn't, uh, felt they didn't have to support a child mm -hmm. because to um, be um, frank about it, the, the ladies could have chosen not to have the child mm -hmm. kind of thing, and mm -hmm. then the marriage rate trends mm -hmm. from that time. Yeah. Um, in, the, uh, in this little book, I go into uh, the whole question about the change in American family structure from 1965 to the present. Uh, if, we had, uh, if we had the same sort of uh, family structure, or let's put it this way, even kind of um, you know, cruder uh, measures. Uh, the same proportions of men who were married and never married and uh, not divorced or divorced as we had in 65, um, we'd have much higher work rates today than we have. Uh, we'd have much higher proportions of men uh, seeking work than we have. Uh, there is no... Uh, there's no doubt at all that the disintegration of the former family structure in the United States is part and parcel of this uh, collapse of work for men and of the flight from uh, work for men. Now, I'm not sure it's all in one direction. I mean, I think, for instance, if, you are, if you've been convicted of a felony and you can't uh, find work for whatever reason, you're probably not as attractive a marriage partner as you might have been if you had a, pretty, had a, cl a cleaner record. But there's no question that the, that the decay and decline, and we can call it a decay and decline, of the American family over the last half century and more is part and parcel of what we see here. Hello, thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, is there any uh, correlation that you've seen between um, people fleeing from the labor force and the increased challenges with mental health faced in our day mm. with severe depression, anxiety, maybe um, some birth defects that might be increasing too, like autism. Um, that. That's okay. That's a really uh, that's a really interesting and I think important question. And I um, I have to confess that there are aspects of it that I'm pretty clueless about addressing. Autism, I can't uh, I can't speak to at all or to uh, birth defects. Uh, I can address to some degree the question of self-reported disability, including depression, anxiety, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> th uh, there is, uh, if you look at the, uh, the various data that I tried to pull together from different sources on this, I get a kind of a mixed picture. I would say it's inconclusive. Um, there, is, uh, there is evidence 
of increased qualification for disability benefits on the basis of um, uh, psychiatric uh, issues, psychological issues, sadness, depression. Um, of course, there's also an increase in what's called musculoskeletal um, uh, awards, uh, people who have bad backs. Um, it's much easier for a doctor to determine whether somebody's got tuberculosis or not than to determine whether they, uh, whether they have pain in their back or whether they have um, uh, very seriously sad feelings. So there's a subjective evaluation problem there. Um, if you take a look at the longer term self-evaluation data out of things like the uh, uh, panel survey and income dynamics and things like that. The, the longer term self-reported proportion of men with uh, work limiting disabilities of various sorts, um, more or less, it, it isn't absolutely flat, but it sort of follows an inconclusive curve over time. So um, I, have no, I have no doubt that an enormous number of men who are uh, not in the labor force are feeling some sort of uh, uh, psychiatric, psychological, emotional, or metaphysical stress. I mean, and I think very, by not being in the workforce and the, all of the questions of identity that come up, that might be enough to, uh, uh, to provoke some of that. Uh, so it's, it's a huge problem, and it's, uh, and it's one that I think we need to be empathetic about. Thank you. As emerging uh, aspects, of, as aspects of the sharing economy yes. emerge, such as ride sharing, house sharing, mm -hmm. things of that nature, how will these terms at, that you have used in your presentation be redefined if they are redefined mm. at going forward? Mm. Well, uh, that's a very good question. And partly it has to do uh, with how well the government or uh, big data in the private sector will be able to track things. I mean, <clears throat> in principle, and we know that there is uh, often a big gap between in principle and in practice, but in principle, the U.S. labor statistics are supposed to uh, track and follow uh, paid work for anybody who, uh, who is paid and does more than an hour's work in, uh, in a week, I think in the month before the, uh, before the survey takes place. So it doesn't matter if you're doing a, a job, you know, doing a run for Uber or if you're uh, doing something in the gig economy or anything else, it should be covered. Now that doesn't mean that it actually will be covered. I mean, one of the questions that nagged at me when I was putting together this study was, um, how much moonlighting are we missing? You know, how, how much under the table or moonlighting are we missing? And there may be uh, there may be quite a bit of it, but I wonder about that. Uh, for one thing, the IRS, which is not our ultimate arbiter, but pays a certain amount of attention to wage flows in the United States, doesn't seem to think that the uh, that they're missing uh, enormous sums from the moonlighting effect. Uh, for another thing, in these time use surveys. Uh, which, as I say, may not be perfectly accurate, but give us maybe a, a good enough for government work a snapshot. Uh, the, the amount of hours worked reported by the guys who say that they're out of the labor force averages out to just about seven minutes a day. Um, unless, unless thousands and thousands of people every year are misrepresenting that particular aspect of their lives, we wouldn't get that sort of consistency. So, I hope that our government statistics system is able to keep up with changes in our society, and this would be one of the uh, key charges that employment statistics would have to do. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming here. Thank um, you so much. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I've noticed that you've made a 
you've made a pointed effort to not postulate as to direct reasoning behind this. Um, you did mention earlier um, when, when you were discussing 1965 and mm -hmm. the rollout with the war on poverty and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, uh, and how today even that we're essentially uh, we're the, the government is funding this with, with mm -hmm. welfare, and so, mm -hmm. which is indisputable, you said. Um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, I'm aware this is, is difficult uh, to really express and to, to make a guess about, but, but where, where did we go wrong, I guess? And, and when you were presenting this to Congress, which yeah, I don't doubt that you did, uh, what, what sort of questions did they present to you in regards to this? Well, actually, the, my, my testimony was on uh, uh, something different. I've got, I've got a sick fascination with North Korea, and I was talking mm -hmm. about the North Korean threat and what maybe we ought to try to do about that. Um, I mean, the problem, is, the problem is so big and so prolonged that it can be looked at as a sort of a historical episode. And one of the difficulties, I suppose, with um, the advantages or difficulties of, uh, of historical analysis is that uh, everything kind of depends upon everything else. Um, when, uh, when, I, uh, when I take a look at this, um, I mean, I don't know exactly why we had the change in, um, in family structure that we've had in the uh, post-war era, but that would seem to be very uh, deeply interwoven with uh, much of what we see here. I don't uh, quite know why we had the explosion of crime and the big uh, counter reaction of punishment that we had, but that's indisputably, I think, part of the tableau. Um, with social welfare programs, um, I mean, there are, you can always do alternative histories and what ifs. I mean, one of the what ifs that comes to mind is what if we had, um, what if we had gone bankrupt the way that Sweden did when the Swedish welfare state ran out of other people's money? Uh, and reconstructed their welfare state in the 1990s. Um, so modern Sweden's welfare state has a work-first principle undergirding it. It's very generous, and it intends to be very generous. I mean, many, I think, here in America would say it's overly generous, but they want it to be that way, and it's their nation. Um, the, uh, the approach uh, in the reconfigured uh, Swedish welfare state is um, if you show up for job training, and you show up for job placement, and you then show up for work, you get the sort of the keys to the welfare state kingdom. Uh, but that's almost diametrically opposite from the uh, disability uh, archipelago that we have today in the United States, where there's an incentivization for being helpless and dependent. Um, I don't think it had to work that way. I certainly, I mean, I certainly. I, mean, I, I, mean, I believe in human agency, so I, I'm, I'm not a historical determinist. Um, but, um, but it hasn't changed, although I, I think and hope uh, very much that it's possible to change that. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Put that back in. Okay, um, I have a question, uh, two questions actually. The yep. first one is about the disparagement um, disparag before between the US numbers that you showed us and the international numbers. Yeah. And looking at the slide, the slide that we were just on as well, yep. and you said that our incarceration rate is so much yep. higher. Yep. Could the could that be the factor that actually explains some of our placement on this particular chart? Thank you for asking that. Um, in, in this little book, uh, I argued that that's one of the keys to the mystery. So that helps explain why our performance has been so much poorer than other rich societies, because they don't have the same sort of uh, um, crime and punishment circumstances that we do. Uh, it also, I think, helps to explain 
Uh, let's see, let me go to this. I think it helps to explain this mystery here. Um, American guys who are high school dropouts have way higher uh, proportions of felonies and prison sentencing in their background than foreign uh, high school dropouts, at least in our country. In our country, they don't have the same proportion. And it also helps to explain uh, some of the gap that we've seen emerging between men and women, because the proportion for women obviously isn't as high as for men. So, uh, so I think, yes, this is a big, I mean, this, this, I don't think this is the magic key that unlocks all of the mystery, but it's clearly a big part that I think, as I said earlier, I think this has been scandalously ignored. And you can understand how the public ignores it if the government doesn't collect the numbers on it that would help us evaluate the problem or help policymakers see which sorts of approaches are more effective in facilitating reentry for people who had paid their debt to society. Well, and that was my follow-up. Why do you think, and for a government that studies everything at nauseum, why are they not looking at this? Um, I'm actually mystified by this, and um, I've I think I've complained to other people while I've been out here. I've complained to almost everybody about this. Um, over the last year, I've looked for the one righteous senator in the United States Senate who will write the little one paragraph letter to the Commerce Department requesting the information from the Census Bureau on what the this gets very technical, but on what the linked administrative records show about work rates for guys who are on probation or on parole vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country. It would take one person in the Census Bureau with all the privacy you know, problems dealt with, and they can be dealt with, it would take about two weeks. It would cost nothing. And uh, red and blue uh, senators, male and female senators, none of their staffs, none of the senators that I've tried to reach out to uh, have shown any interest in it, and it absolutely mystifies me. I can't give you an answer. I recommend uh, Senator Mike Lee. He might be interested. Okay, so I had a, I had a two-part question, um, and this is more clarification for me, because I think this is what you said, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. My eyes are going bad, and I was too far back to see stuff yeah. and hear stuff at the same time. Um, so my first question is, we see the work, uh, um, men's participation is down. Yep. Um, my curiosity is, um, is women's participation up where men is down? Ah, and good. if not, that would indicate to me that that's uneconomical um, because if it was economical, it would be exactly proportionate, <laughs> but if it's not, then it's uneconomical, which then also tells me that it's in society's best interest to incentivize men to be in the workforce. So those are my questions and I wanted clarification on because I, I thought that's what we were, you were saying in lesser words or more words, but I wasn't sure. Thank you very much for asking that because uh, I'm, I'm glad to have an opportunity to clarify that. Um, I, I do go into that question with charts and figures and so forth in the book. Um, between 1948 and the year 2000, the work rate and labor force participation rate for women surged in the United States. Now, at the same time that the work rate was going up for women between 48 and 2000, the overall work rate for America was going up too. So that means that women weren't just replacing men, they were supplementing men, they were augmenting men. Um, after the year 2000, something happened, and is a very not good something. Uh, it's not just what I'm about to mention. A lot of other things, I think, have been moving in a pretty spooky direction since then in terms of society and economic trends. But around the year 2000, the work rates, the employment to population ratios for women peaked. They reached what are up to now their all-time high. And they've been heading south since then. So since the year 2000, 
the work rates for men and the work rates for women have both been going down kind of in parallel. The men and women are sharing the same pain of a, uh, of a weaker, more problematic workforce. Um, so in the, uh, up until about the year 2000, I would have said it was win-win. And since the year 2000, I would say it's been lose-lose. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. So thank you all very much. I very much appreciate your coming here.